Welcome to Sounds Like Portraits. I'm Philip Ungar. This is a podcast with creative humans. In this episode, you'll hear Eric Rippert, chef at Le Bernardin in New York. When I sat with him in his office at the basement of his restaurant, he told me how spirituality has changed his life and his creativity. He started as a tough chef, screaming and humiliating his team, throwing pots and pans on the floor because he thought it was the right thing to do. And of course, over the years, his cooks left the kitchen, especially the best ones. Then he realized that something was wrong with him. It's time to listen to him talking about his transformation into a better human and a fantastic chef. But before, he told me what he tried to do all his life. All my life, I've always tried to be a better person. When we look at 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, and today it has been a big transformation. I can tell you that when I was a young chef, I was uh, pretty strong in the kitchen. Um, borderline abusive, verbally abusive, not physical, but verbally. Uh, I was screaming, I was humiliating the cooks, I was throwing pots and pans in the garbage and on the floor and breaking china, and, and I thought it was the right thing to do. And then um, I realized that anger is a weakness, and uh, having a more constructive approach, a more compassionate approach, is a strength. So this is to give you an example of what is the transformation and what are the efforts of Eric that wants to become a better person. We are going to talk about that. But tell me first, was food a key thing for you as a child? First of all, I had a passion for food from a very young age. At five years old, I didn't know I, was, I wanted to become a chef. I wanted to eat <laughs> well. But then when I was 10, 11, 12, 13, I was looking at cookbooks uh, and so on. At 15 is when I decided to go to culinary school. Was there an alternative at the time? Well, not too many alternatives at 15 because I was such a bad student. It was time to leave the school and go to what they call a, a professional college. And uh, I ended up in a principal office with my mother who was not happy. Um, and I looked very sad, but I was very happy inside because I was not going in high school. I didn't want to do that. So I said I want to become a chef and uh, I would like to do culinary school. And then I remember the principal said, uh, do you have another wish? I could potentially, <laughs> and I knew <laughs> my mother would like <laughs> faint. I say, um, I would like to be a forest ranger. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, okay, you're going to be a chef. <laughs> How did you start learning cooking? I start learning cooking by observing, by not necessarily being involved in the process of cooking. And I was allowed in the kitchens of my grandmothers and, and my mom, I was allowed to watch and I was allowed to be in the kitchen. And it was their world. No men were in, allowed to come when they were baking or when they were cooking something special. So I was allowed to observe and I took an advantage of that. Then I met when I was young, like 15, 16, 17, 18, a chef who was our neighbor. And he, again, he was a man of an incredible temper, previously a legionnaire in a foreign legion. He accepted me in his kitchen just to, again, watch and eat whatever he wanted to give me. And that was very, very interesting and powerful to me. And then when I went to culinary school, obviously I had to learn the basics. Uh, can you give me an example? Well, let's say I give you a carrot and I say, I want you to cut this carrot in dices, perfect dices. Are you, if you have never touched a knife in your life, are you able to do that? I confirm, no. <laughs> <laughs> and on top of it, not only do those perfect squares, but in a timely manner. I mean, you don't have the entire afternoon to do a carrot. It's a job that should be done in three minutes. That's what I'm talking about in terms of basics. Tell me about the very last thing you bought at the Paris airport just before flying to the United States. Yes, so at the Paris airport, I was uh, with five francs in my pocket and I had enough money to buy Playboy. 
this is what I wanted. And then I, it was a book on the corner of my eye that interests me. And I look at the book and uh, it was a book about Tibet and, and spirituality. It was a pocket book, not expensive, same price as the magazine. And I went back and forth and back and forth. And finally, I took the book. And that was the beginning for me of a very powerful transformation. It um, led to more interest about not only the Tibetan culture, but about Buddhism. And slowly but surely, I educated myself first through books, then going to teachings and, and Buddhist teachings and so on. And I find a way that was logical and inspiring to me to do things that are good for everybody around myself, including myself. What was the turning point? What made you interested in this book instead of Playboy yeah. magazine? Well, the turning point will come a bit later. Uh, I am already landed <laughs> in Washington DC. I am in the US and I'm reading because I asked my mother to send me some books from the Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama is in the news at that time, and uh, I know that he got the Nobel Prize, and, but I don't know much about him. And she sent me a book called uh, Sans Elephants sur, sur un brin, un brin d'herbe. Uh, I don't think it's a translation in English, but it's basically 100 elephants on a blade of grass, I guess. And the book starts with his acceptance for the Nobel Prize, for, for the Peace Nobel Prize. And that was the real turning point in my life that decided what I will do with, uh, with, with my lifestyle that today is very different than when I was 20 years old. Did this change affect the climate you wanted to create in your kitchen? Yes. In the kitchens, it was very tough. But I have to say the French society in, uh, in the mid-60s, early 70s, 80s, uh, was pretty was pretty tough. I mean, it was very common to see parents smacking their children or spanking the babies, or not babies, but toddlers, or the teachers in school to pull the ears or pull the hair, and it was physical abuse. Today we call that physical abuse. It was and it, very common to have parents really screaming at their children, and kitchens are... are a difficult world, it's physical, it's uh, stressful. It can lead to abuse if you're not really uh, cautious. And if you believe that abuse is the right way of educating people, well, kitchen can be an amazing training ground for that. When I was a young chef, I first of all emulated some of my mentors. Uh, and at the same time, I was convinced that not being nice to the staff and Having my tantrum, screaming at them and terrorizing them was the right thing to, to do. And sure enough, they were leaving. And what happened is that at the end, I ended up being miserable myself because nobody is happy to be angry. You cannot mix those two feelings. Your brain cannot process. You're either way happy or you are angry. So I was miserable borderline depressed because basically all the employees were leaving one by one, especially the best ones. Uh, the ones that were staying uh, were terrorized and were shaking and, and someone who's shaking and who's terrorized and who's not inspired cannot do a better job than someone who's happy to be learning and that will give 100%. I re remember one, it was in my house at night on the sofa, and I said, you know, it's something is wrong here. I don't know what it is, um, and I said, I have to, I have to think about what's wrong. And I realized I was totally, totally going into the wrong direction by this attitude in the kitchen. And I said, well, from now on, I'm gonna have to change, and it's gonna be not e an easy task because you create those mechanisms in yourself where you let anger take control and anger is very powerful. It's a blind energy too, but, but it's very powerful. And then I had to retrain my sous chef who were trained to be abusive. I had to suddenly say, hey guys, we were wrong yesterday. Now we're changing. I had to convince. So what did you say? I said, guys, I don't want us to do that anymore. 
and it took time for them to believe me. They thought they were betrayed. They were they were they didn't believe that you can change and you can do a good job without being oppressing the team. They didn't believe that for a long time. So I had to convince them and then I had to show by example, lead by example. And today in our kitchen, it's definitely something that we do not accept. Uh, now we have some bad days. It, it happens that someone lose his cool. If it happens, which is human, we do not glorify that. And then at the end of the day or the service, when the action is over, that person has to apologize to, to the other person uh, on the front of the staff and say, I was wrong, I should have not yell at you or not say words or whatever. And, and it's the way we work here at Le Bernardin. Does your Buddhism affect your cooking? How do you say that? One thing that is interesting is that I have conflict uh, with myself because animals that we serve at Le Bernardin uh, have suffered because when you serve, we are a seafood restaurant, so we serve mainly seafood. Uh, all those species that are caught die suffocating and it's it's something that I have a hard time to to um, accept. This is something that I, I'm struggling with, the idea of suffering for the animals. And uh, at the same time, I know that if I was serving only vegetables, Le Bernardin wouldn't be, wouldn't exist anymore. And in a society that we live in today, if Le Bernardin closes, it doesn't make a difference. I'm not going to inspire the entire industry to suddenly eat vegetables. So it's a conflict, but when I see a piece of fish in a kitchen, when I see a live lobster that's going to be killed and so on, I have a tremendous compassion for that ingredient or for that life that is going to become an ingredient. Is there a solution to kill animals in a in a good way, I would say? Well, ultimately, when you take the life of someone, it's suffering. I mean, except if you put everyone to sleep and, uh, and it happens in their sleep, I don't think it's possible. Uh, we cannot have farmers taking care of animals and, and at the end, killing them I in their sleep or something like that. I, d I, don't, th I don't think, at least in, in the 21th century, I know that it won't happen. What we try to do is to use farmers and to use fishermen and people who are dealing with animals who have the best practices. Um, today in America, we have a new label. It's called humanly raised, which means that the animals are living their life that is supposed to live. The fishermen that deliver fish to the Le, Le Bernardin are not coming from those big factory boats and, and it's a more artisanal way of, of catching fish and so on. But again, at the end of the day, it's still suffering. Tell me about the people who were so essential to your cooking. I mean, Joël Robuchon, who was the, I think the first, your first mentor. Joël Robuchon is definitely the chef that had the most impact on me in terms of rigor, hard work, search for perfection. He was, in my opinion, and, and he's no longer with us, but the very best chef of the 20th century that I knew. Uh, and I have not seen anyone uh, getting close to that level of perfection, although perfection is subjective. Can you give me an example of this uh, research for perfection? Well, I could give you millions of examples for search for perfection, but he was never happy for himself first and then with us <laughs> uh, who were ac accomplishing his vision, but he was never pleased with the result. He always thought we could do better and he, al he was always pushing us to do better and we will never get compliments or very rarely, it was not to be mean, it was because he didn't think we were giving our maximum and he thought we could push the envelope further. He had a dish that was made with caviar and it was a lobster gelée and, and the cauliflower cream on top and then we were putting dots on top of it and he wanted, first of all, the dish to be delicious and beautiful. 
So every detail was very important to him. But the dots had to be of a certain size, which was maybe um, one millimeter, and they had to be separated by one millimeter in every bowl that was um, hosting that dish. It was supposed to be, I don't remember now, but let's say 134 dots. You had to do that. And he was looking at it and looking at it and looking at it before he sent it to the client. And when he was silent, it meant we were basically okay, but we were not like excellent. That attitude has some plus and minuses. The plus is that you push yourself and you learn a lot from your mentor. The minuses are that you never necessarily um, believe in yourself and uh, you end up being insecure sometimes about your achievements. I have seen a lot of cooks coming out of Robuchon kitchen being very successful, but I have seen a lot of other cooks leaving his kitchen being very insecure and not believing in themselves and, not, and therefore not having a clear vision, a clear goal and not achieving what they could have achieved. The vision, that's something you can't learn from someone. It's something that comes from inside. Yes, vision comes from inside, but you can be inspired by others. I think it's very important to be inspired and then to be yourself. That was my mantra when I was young, be yourself. But to become yourself and to have a level of happiness and to know that you are trying to do the right thing or you are doing the, the right thing. Along the way, you need people to guide you, to inspire you, and then you take your own decisions. But to be aware and open to interact with people who are knowledgeable and people who are inspiring is key. That's the reason why you needed to meet Jean-Louis Paladin. Yes. It's your mentor in terms of creativity. Yes. With Robuchon, I had learned precision, tremendous discipline, and rigor. I was a very good technician. With Jean-Louis Paladin, uh, so suddenly I'm going to uh, be exposed to someone who's extremely creative and very generous in sharing his way of creativity, his philosophy. When I came to Washington, D.C., Jean-Louis Paladin, Paladin was at the Watergate Hotel, famous also for the scandal of the Watergate, but very famous for its food. And Jean-Louis said to me, he said, you know, you have to open your mind right now. I cannot deal with you. You're a robot. Try to be creative and, and stop duplicating what you have learned until now. What you have learned was the basics of the future. If you want to become a chef, you have to keep the knowledge that you have acquired. And now it's time to open your mind and it's time to take risks and not to be scared anymore and to um, start to create. And slowly but surely you are going to find your style. It's going to take time. It doesn't happen overnight, but do not be afraid of mistakes. And Jean-Louis was definitely not afraid of mistakes. He was writing his own menu by hand every day with the products that he was finding uh, on a daily basis or that were delivered to the restaurant on a daily basis. And I have to say, when he was eating a high knot, the meal was absolutely exceptional and it was, no one could compete with him. But to have 365 days a year or 300 days a year if you close the weekends, so imagine creating a menu with, let's even, only 20 dishes or 15 dishes. You cannot have 15 genius ideas 300 years a, a, a year. It doesn't exist. It's a mix of routine and creativity. It was a mix of routine and creativity and it was a mix of success and failure. And he, again, he was not afraid of failure. And I think the clientele was playing the game. They were like, you know what? Probably 90% is going to be amazing or 80% and maybe a couple of things are going to be an experimentation. That was the style of Jean-Louis and he was legendary for that and people will come and uh, will have those amazing heights in terms of sensations and pleasure 
and sometimes a couple of laws here and there, but it was part of the experience, and he wanted to be like that. As for your own style, what kind of risk do you like to take? Because when you pay a high amount of money, you want a, a perfect meal. Mm -hmm. So is it compatible with taking risk? Well, we take risks every day to a certain degree. However, I, I think differently than Jean-Louis Paladin in, in some ways. Now, Jean-Louis Paladin had a restaurant with 30 covers per night. Uh, Le Bernardin is a bigger restaurant with a bigger crew. We have 170 employees, 60 are in the kitchen. It's a place where we have responsibilities toward those employees and the clients. And when we create, we have some guidelines that are pretty basic, but they're very helpful and that prevent potentially uh, a disappointment or a dip in quality. So for instance, first, our first guidance is to say we have a mantra that will define our cooking. The mantra says the fish is the star of the plate, period. Very simple statement. That statement defines everything. We do not cook with fish, we cook for the fish. And therefore, whatever goes in the plate has the, the mission to elevate the qualities of that fish to the next level. So that's very, very important for the, for the sous chefs who are in creativity with me and uh, the creative team to digest the mantra and then to apply it. Then when we change dishes on the menu, we make sure that the new dish is better than the previous dish. I'm not interested to change the dish if it's not going to be better. It has to be. So we try, we eat a lot of our own food. Why do you eat Swiss cheese for your tasting? Yes. The Swiss cheese is actually not that Swiss, but it's Swiss cheese. <laughs> we buy a basic industrial fake gruyere. Industrial? Industrial because the artisanal Swiss cheese that can be amazing has a certain in inconsistency because it's handmade and it's, it's always a little bit different. Industrial has the benefit to have something that is consistent all the time because of all the chemicals and preservatives and artificial flavors, everything that go into that cheese make it perfect to calibre your palate. One day we met with all the sous chefs and I said, everyone is gonna try that cheese and everybody's gonna s make a comment about this cheese. And I said, I'm gonna start. So to me, this cheese is perfectly balanced because it's neither over salted, it's neither bland, it's not too dry, it's not too moist, it's not, and we went on and on and on and on and on. And everybody at the table agreed. And I said, well, that's great because from now on, before we enter the kitchen and we start to test all the, what we call mise en place, which are preparations, I said, we are going to caliber our palate with a couple of pieces of that cheese. Now, if your palate find the cheese over salty, well, that day you happen to have a very sensitive test buds. If your palate find uh, the cheese very bland, uh, or, or over salty, or it's all about yourself. It's not about the cheese, it's always the same. So we have the habit today to have everyone taking the cheese, testing, and saying, oh, last night I had a rough night, I don't know, maybe I went out too late or something, because we have young cooks here. Um, my, my palate is numb. Uh, oh, today, for some reason, I find it too salty. So um, it's the way we are all on the same page. In terms of creativity, what inspires you the most? Inspiration is very tricky because you cannot be creative when you wish. It's not like you press the button and you say, okay, I'm going to be creative. And you are creative and then an hour later you press the button again and you're like, okay, we turn off the button, I'm not creative anymore. Creativity is something that is um, in everyone, I believe, but that you have to cultivate and you have therefore to create a certain environment that is leading to creativity. For instance, I am exposed constantly 
to different products, to different ethnicities, to different um, ingredients, techniques coming from South America, coming from Asia, coming from Europe, uh, that I are married with my uh, roots. Sometimes street food is it's what inspires us the most, and then of course it gets translated into some something in fine dining, which is Le Bernardin. But creativity needs inspiration, and then you need to have peace around you. You need to avoid being in a stressful position. You need to have the right equipment. You need to have the quality that you need in terms of the ingredients. If I say we're going to create something with turnips uh, or black truffles and they are of poor quality, it's not, not much you can do. You will not have the result. In 1995, Le Bernardin got four stars from the New York Times. Did you need that to realize you were a great chef? I joined Le Bernardin team in 91. And in 94, Gilbert Lecoz, who was the founder and executive chef, passed away. And I had a four star in the New York Times uh, eight months later. That was, of course, huge for Le Bernardin, very important. But I was not, I was not confident yet. And I still had um, some remembrance of my experience at Joël Robuchon. I was not sure about myself didn't believe in my talent. Uh, it happened a bit later, it happened in 2000 when I did a book called uh, a Return to Cooking. And that book for me was key because, first of all, I wanted to leave the kitchen and the stress of the kitchen and take a break, basically a retreat and document it. I went uh, to explore the four seasons, like Vivaldi did with the music, but with the cooking. And I rented four houses in different regions, different seasons, of course, with a painter, two photographers, and a writer. And the idea was to wake up every morning uh, for the painter with a white canvas, for the writer with a white page, with the, for the photographers with basically just the film and the camera, and for myself to go and look for products and then come up with menus and ideas that were documented for that book. And when I did that is when I finally realized that I was insulting my luck by not believing in my talent because my food was good and was original and was precise. And I said, oh my God, all those years you have been, you have been mm, not believing and trusting your, your instinct and, and yourself. You have to stop doing that. You have to acknowledge your talent because it's a gift now you have to be careful because you don't want to be pretentious you don't you don't you certainly want to st stay humble and that it's uh, something that i really really talk to the cooks about when i see someone with talent i'm like you have talent be careful not to have a big head work on being humble but at the same time use this talent to go further you have 60 cooks here uh, what do you really do on a daily basis for lunches and dinners? I'm basically doing two jobs, three jobs. I'm the chef, I'm the coach, and I'm the conductor. <laughs> so the conductor is basically, when you go to the Philharmonic, basically directing an entire team of musicians, and one plays the piano, and one plays the trumpet, and the other one the guitar, and, and one sings, and so on. That conductor, to be good, has to know every instrument, has to understand the chords of music and so on. Same thing for a chef. I'm working with all those cooks. I have to delegate. I have to make sure that the one who's in charge of the sauce does a good sauce, and I have to know how to make it, and I have to know how to correct him if he's wrong, and I have to have those knowledge. So um, that basically part of my job. Being a coach means motivating the team, educating the team, sharing the knowledge uh, with them. Being the chef is the persona, is being the ambassador of Le Bernardin. It's the, the one who can go to the dining room and say hello to the clients, who's articulates to be on a podcast, <laughs> because we live in, in a world that is very mediatic. 
I'm the one who is able to go on television and, and can show a technique because it's my role to do that. I'm also an owner and that comes with responsibilities and I have to make sure that we are sustainable, sustainable in terms of uh, financials. Uh, we cannot lose money because there's no one to come and save us. I have to make sure that everybody who works here is protected with benefits and good benefits and eats uh, good food because restaurants feed their employees. Uh, I have to make sure that they make uh, good salaries for the position they have and so on. So all of this is basically my job. Do you want to create a global brand like some of your famous colleagues? No, I have no desire to do that. And I'm not critical of my colleagues who have, some of them have more than 40 restaurants. I'm thinking about Nobu. I'm thinking about uh, some other chefs who have at least 20 or 30 restaurants. They seem to be happy. Sometimes they complain a little bit that they spend a lot of time in planes and not at home. But congratulations to them, but it's not for me. I like to have my, um, my balance. And my balance is in between finding time for the restaurant, finding time for my family, and having time for myself. When you have time for yourself, it's basically being on top of a mountain and observing what's going on in a valley. It's taking distance and, be, and, 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 and reflecting on what's happening in your personal life, in your family life and professional life. When you do that, when you come back <laughs> and you are dealing with your family, I think you are a better family, family member. That family will obviously, I mean, not obviously, but hopefully uh, support you in, in your passion and, and what you do at work. And if you do a good job at work, the team will reward you and support you to, again, take time for yourself and be a good family, ne me family member and so on. I'm going to leave the room. Please hold the microphone and add whatever you want to the interview. Sure. So you are, okay, you are leaving the room. Yes, that's nice. Well, I have to say I had a very interesting hour today talking about my passion and my industry. And hopefully, if you have been inspired today, it's mission accomplished. Um, I had a great time. And when you share your experience, you force yourself to be articulate and when you are articulate it's very good because it makes you understand better about your process it makes you understand uh, yourself in a much better way so today it's very rewarding and also it will have some very positive consequences for myself thank you eric Rippert, for sharing your story It was Sounds Like Portraits, a podcast by Philippe Ungar. Music Charmeuse de Serpent, composed and conducted by Olivier Glisson. See you soon for the next episode.